Thank you all for joining us tonight at Japan Society for where they create Japan. So often, buildings, history, and culture are described as the, the essence of a city, the things that define it. But I would argue that it's the people, the creatives, that really form the soul of, of a particular place. Tonight, I'm honored to introduce Paul Barbera, creator of the book, Where They Create Japan. Tonight, we'll begin with a presentation by the photographer, followed by a panel discussion featuring leader, leading creatives, all of whom Paul has shot. Hiroko Takahashi, Matthew Waldman, Masashi Kawamura, and Kanta Shimizu. Following that, we'll have a panel discussion and an audience Q&A. Paul Barbera graduated from Australia's Victorian College of Arts in 1994 and has traveled the world with his photography since then. His photos have been featured in Vogue Living, Elle Decor, Martha Stewart, and other high-end publications. He has also been featured in the New York Times, the Paris Review, and Forbes. His new book, Where They Create Japan, gives a behind-the-scenes look at the studios of some of Japan's top creatives, many of which we will be getting to see today. As I mentioned, our panelists today are Hiroko Takahashi, artist and innovation specialist Matthew Waldwin, and Masa Kawamura and Kanta Shimizu of the New York and Tokyo-based Creative Lab Party. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Paul Barbera to the stage. Um, quick thank you to Japan Society for hosting tonight. Um, and my name is Paul, obviously, and uh, I'm the author of Where They Create. And a quick thank you to, uh, also to Matthew um, and Hiroko, who came all the way out from uh, Tokyo and just arrived only a couple of hours ago. Um, and we have party, which are in the back and are going to come out soon. And a quick little behind the scenes, uh, Jono and Queenie, who helped me actually make this happen tonight. So um, I hope to give you some insights into um, the making of, of the book um, and, uh, I guess, visiting uh, studios. Um, so my first, that, by the way, that was, that's the uh, cover, of, that's the book, probably all saw it at the front. Um, so how did uh, Where They Create begin? Um, in 2009, I was visiting uh, a friend in Rome and uh, he needed some help building a website, so uh, we did that and he asked to shoot, for me to shoot his studio, which I did. And shooting, um, I guess, his space and his interior, I. I often shot uh, artists' spaces for probably three or four or five years before that. Um, so it was only natural for me to kind of shoot his space. And as I'm shooting his space and putting together this website, I had this little moment where I realized I had this kind of archive of, of studios, and I thought, why not make it a project? And um, with a friend of mine who happened to be visiting the studio at the same time, uh, Michael Nicolacci, we came up with the name Where They Create. And, um, I think in the first, it probably took me about a day, and I came up with the, built the site. Um, I guess it's also fair to say that this is a moment in time when uh, you could actually start building your own website without too much programming uh, skills at all. So I travel a lot with uh, my work as a photographer, um, so I was able to cover a lot of ground. So I'd travel for an assignment, look up an artist or creative, or be introduced to somebody, and, and go off and doc document them. So, so I already had an archive, plus um, I traveled a lot. So very quickly, it, it garnered a, a small following and, uh, and got some attention. So I'm going to fast forward to 2017. This is the uh, current iteration of the website, eight years on. Um, about 200 studios photographed, uh, almost 30 cities. We've added a little bit of a Q&A, so every story has just um, a couple of questions we ask about, it, about the space and funny things we'd find in the space. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. So to jump back now to 2011, um, so how did Where They Create become a book? Um, I was in photographing through a friend of a friend, Frame uh, Publishers, shooting their office for Where They Create, and uh, Robert, the editor-in-chief, 
asked me what I'm doing with the project. You know, what, what do I expect it to, to be one day? And I said, well, you know, like all photographers, it would be amazing if it could be a, a book one day. And he said, well, we love it and we'd love to publish it, which is probably the, the, the quickest uh, book pitch and deal uh, well, I've ever got, but it was very quick. And so we sort of set, set off to do the book, and um, it, it, it covers a wide variety of um, genres and locations. So acne, opening ceremony, fantastic man, um, painter Jeremiah Goodman, um, and it became actually Frame's best-selling book in uh, the States. So that brings me to, I guess, why we're here tonight, which is uh, what was the inspiration for where they create Japan? Um, 2014, I was in uh, Hiroshima for a client photographing a high-end uh, woodworking factory. And it was just such a pleasure running around this factory for 10 days, documenting all the work that was going on. I was just, I, I guess, mesmerised with the, with the craftsmanship, attention to detail and the work ethic that was going on in this, in this uh, kind of family-run business. Um, and I was, all, while I was doing it, I was already thinking, I just, I need to come back, I need to come back, I need to come back and make a book. And so when I returned back to New York with my partner, Queenie, we, we set off to write a proposal. But what was important was that we weren't just doing another book, that it could be a series, could be more than just like one book on Japan, but, you know, lead into other things. So we settled on, settled on the idea that it should be based around uh, geographical locations. And of course, I'm gonna start with my favorite country, which is Japan, and with all that energy that I had. And uh, Frame, lucky enough, agreed. And um, yeah, in, in some ways also, um, I, I was also using as an excuse to travel back to Japan and try to understand Japan. And it was sort of a self-funded sabbatical of, of such. Um, so the making of the book. So with Frame on board, they introduced me to their local, um, I guess, design writer correspondent, Kanai Hasegawa. And she had a large collection of a lot of friends, actually, a lot of people she knew within the architecture and design world. But we wanted to make sure that it was a diverse book, you know, ranging not just from architecture and design. So we put together a big crazy list of about 300 names and we had to vet it down to about 32, um, which of course is quite, quite difficult to, to, to make, to go through that process and we had four or five of us uh, going through that vetting process. Um, and I had a, a really big concern and that was that, um, in, in my experience anyway, I, I feel like sometimes J Japanese can be quite private, um, very much pro orientated towards the end product, not so much the process. So I was worried that um, maybe nobody would even agree to let me shoot their studio. Uh, but I guess we're here tonight, so obviously people gave me access, so it was fine. Um, yeah, and at the end, it's all about access. That's, that's the hardest thing to, I guess, uh, convince people to, to let you in and, and reveal their, their world to you, where they make, where they create. Um, so the reason I'm showing this particular image is that there's four studios here, and uh, each one of them had never really had their studio spaces um, photographed before. It's the first time that they opened up to the public. Um, so it was quite an honour. It's, it's, always, it's always quite an honour to, um, to be let into people's spaces and you want to always make sure you're doing it uh, justice. So that leads me to Tarawando. Um, so how do you get famed architect to be in your book or project? So. Um, Kane didn't know him or know anyone who knew him. Frame didn't have any contact with him. We had no way of actually accessing him. Um, and on the website, there's only a, a fax number and a hand, and, and well, it only accepts faxes and handwritten letters. So I've not done either of those for probably 15, 20 years. So I found some, found some website that you could send a fax through. I paid two dollars through PayPal. It told me it sent. I thought, okay, that was a fun exercise. I guess we should try to either forget about it or find someone who actually knows him. Well, four days later, I received this. Uh, Thank you for your kind fax of February 4th, addressed to Mr. Tarawando. In regards to your new book, Where They Create Japan by Frame Publishers, uh, he is interested in the book and has accepted to be photographed by you at our studio in Osaka uh, in March or April 2016. And this was a, a beautiful moment just because it meant that we were kind of validated in doing the book and uh, we knew we were on the right track. 
in contrast, uh, Mariko Mori. Uh, we, we had her on a list, but we had a lot of trouble trying to get a hold of her. Um, and I ended up going along to her exhibition and met her gallerist and explained what we were doing. And of course, before we knew it, he agreed and he was quite happy to introduce us. And he organized for us to shoot her um, at her tea house. Now, her studio is actually in London. And I would have loved to have gone over to see it, but it just logistically wasn't going to work out. So uh, we stayed, uh, we, we, I agreed and went to her tea house to, to photograph her there. Um, and that, that was a nice moment to be able to have, uh, to have her in it. The only thing is, I guess in, in many ways I have my own cliches about what a studio should be and how it should look. Um, and a tea house and uh, a minimalist space. I often tell creatives when I go to turn up, um, you please leave the space as it is. I will find the peace and order. Well, this was completely peaceful and completely ordered. Um, and I was a bit doubtful, actually, at the beginning when I was photographing it. But in retrospect, and, and once I see it in the book, it really adds a nice uh, counterpoint and contrast to the whole, to the whole book because I think um, all, all creatives work in all manner of space. And this is a really nice uh, example of something very different. So Shinji Yomaki. Um, sometimes you get um, to know someone actually quite well and they really open up their, their whole world to you. Um, Shinji Yomaki, this is actually at uh, Tokyo University where he's a professor and this is his atelier. And we spent a day running around showing me some installations he had in the city of Tokyo. And, um, and then he said to me, look, I actually have another studio down where I live, two hours south from, from Tokyo. Um, maybe you should come down and... Um, I can show you my, 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 my other studio. I have a home studio and a studio on the water in a port. So I came down and um, we, we had been talking about food the day before and he heard that I loved chow mushi. So he had his wife who was a cook to make me some chow mushi. And uh, this is his father-in-law who's a fourth generation uh, um, tuna trader and a collector of uh, samurai swords. And it was a, quite a ritual, actually. It was, a, it was a, good, a good hour to unwrap them and then present them to me. And uh, I was actually, obviously, allowed, you can see here, I was holding one. But the amazing thing about these, well, this particular sword that I'm holding is 500 years old. And when you're holding a blade that old, um, it's very important that you're not uh, putting your, uh, your breath or any saliva or it, so anything onto it because the... Uh, uh, the moisture can damage the blade. So when you're holding it, you have to actually not talk at all. And I had Shinji Yamaki saying, shh, stop talking. But it was really, it was a cathartic experience holding that, uh, holding that blade. So I'm going to end where I actually began. Um, this was the very first uh, studio visit, which is uh, famed architect Ken Gakuma. Uh, he's currently working on the Olympic Stadium for 2020 uh, Tokyo Olympics. And um, he was gracious enough to find some time in his crazy schedule. I think he has 100, more than 100 people working for him. And he gave me 10 minutes um, at 10 p.m. I'll take it. I'll take, I'll take whatever he's going to give me. That's fine. I, I, 10 minutes is plenty. I actually only spend about an hour, to be honest, on every studio. So 10 minutes is actually quite okay. Uh, the problem is, you probably could tell by all the other photos, nothing is shot at night or under artificial light. I only work under daylight. But, okay, another little compromise, but I'll take it, that's okay. I also didn't want to miss the opportunity, and he was the first one off the bat. So I thought, okay, I'm going to get there a couple days before to climatise and just get myself, get myself right. Um, so I booked my flights, and of course, I leave two days early. But we hit a storm in Dallas. I get rerouted to LA. What should have been 19 hours ended up being 40 hours. So I arrived, I guess, in time. I made it. It wasn't that I wasn't, I wasn't late, but I was very flustered and totally jet lagged. I get up. I do my portraits. I'm happy with, with what we've done. I thank Mr. Kenga Kumar. And um, he says, please join me for a coffee, which is like, oh, that's very nice. OK, I'm not going to say no. So I sit down to have a coffee with Kenga Kumar. I'm not quite sure what I want to talk about. I'm not really ready for it. And I said, look, um, actually, I've just been reading a book called um, uh, Shinto, The Way Home, because I think if I understand um, the belief system of a country, I can understand its people. But I'm really confused. I'm really struggling with this, with this, with all the concepts. 
And he said something really nice to me, which has stuck with me till now, and that is, he said, Paul, um, I am a professor of architecture. Um, I work with the theme of Shinto in my work. Uh, I'm also Japanese, and I also find it very confusing and very, very difficult, and, um, which was beautiful. And then he said, it's also okay not knowing. And that was, I thought, that made me feel much better about trying to learn it myself. And so I want to finish by saying this, that, you know, 20,000 images, which is about what I shot to edit it down to the book, and two months in Japan, I realised also it's OK not knowing. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Hiroko Takahashi. I work in Tokyo as an artist. え、固定観念を覆し世の中の人々に考える uh, my work is distinguished by a certain kind of expression by which I use only circles and straight lines in my patterns. And I mainly work using kimonos. This is a picture of a current exhibition of mine in Tokyo. Along with photographs, I also have uh, mannequins as part of the uh, works that I do. These are characterized by something called niodachi, which is a very masculine way of standing uh, in an imposing stance with the feet placed apart. え、as Japanese women, we were told to uh, wear kimonos a certain way, to keep our feet together and to walk a certain way. I actually did this purposely to um, overcome that um, previous way of thinking and to um, have people throughout the world think about, again, their preconceptions and their customs. I'm trying to send a message of rethinking these ideas. I also do work involving various designs with these circular and lined patterns. この写真だけ入ってたんですけれども、これはFendiのバッグをデザインした時のものです。This picture shows a Fendi bag that I designed. え、これはあのポールが撮影してくださった写真ですね。this is a picture from Paul's work. And it is the uh, cover. And I'm very honored that he selected it to be in such a prominent place. あの、ポールの写真を見ると、私とは全く違った視点を持っていて、すごくあの、私のスタジオをまた新しい視点で捉えることができて、あの、大変面白い、あの、写真集になっています。ぜひご覧ください。I'd love for you to check out Paul's book because it offered a chance for me to um, look at this from a different point of view, to see my own studio um, from someone else's point of view. Uh, it came out uh, very interesting. I have many different works, so if you have a chance, uh, please take a look at my homepage. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Matthew Waltman. I guess I should go to my slide here, right? Oh, that's my name. And uh, I, my work uh, mainly concerns what uh, is a big word, techno-progressivism, and also universal language. All of the projects I do, whether it's expressed in physical product or in linguistic exercises or graphic design, is about communicating concepts uh, without having to explain them and without language so that they transcend geopolitical borders. And uh, the thing I'm most famous for is a line of accessories uh, called Nuka. It's a futurist fashion brand. And uh, when I was still doing that, that's when uh, 
Uh, he came to my studio, to, which is actually, I did not clean up. I, I followed his advice, um, and it was quite messy, so it's going to look quite different than the other studios that you see. I also want to mention that how wonderful and global uh, this en endeavor is. The way I met uh, Paul was via a Finnish creative genius, and they shared a studio in, in 2000 in Amsterdam. So it goes from Amsterdam to New Amsterdam, which is New York, and then to Tokyo, and back here uh, in New York, which is really wonderful, and it uh, makes me feel like I'm doing the right thing. So there's a, I don't know, probably be better if Paul described these photos here, but uh, for my um, studio space, I like to have a space that has a lot of visual stimulation and a lot of things to touch and books to look at. It's also about like one's business. Uh, do you have clients come to your studio or not? And I don't. Um, sometimes I do. So my studio is really more about me and my stuff and things that I find uh, to be inspired. Uh, bicycles, a robot that followed me home from Japan. Um, lots of plants, mainly cacti. And uh, that's one of, uh, that's me sketching. See, this is, I'm kind of embarrassed how messy some of these, uh, some of these photos are. But uh, I'm actually, Nuka is, uh, has unfortunately filed for bankruptcy, so I am studio-less. Had to put everything into storage. It's the first time in, oh gosh, 30 years I haven't had a studio. Like, we're, the first time I've ever put things in storage. So it's a whole new world for me. And I'm actually designing now out of my apartment, which is a very uh, scary thing. It's a, like a new environment, but uh, I'm gonna show you two products that I've actually done um, that debuted at uh, the gift show. You can go see it, I think tomorrow's the last day, uh, for some Japanese manufacturers. There's a uh, vase made out of cedar wood and also some ceramics with some very interesting glazes. Um, I've also worked with some traditional, what I'm doing is bringing a new way of thinking to old ways of manufacturing how successful it is remains to be seen, but that's the latest uh, project that I've been working on, and uh, I'm gonna keep it brief so that we have more time for Q&A and panel discussions, and now we can bring up the wonderful talents of party. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hello. I'm Masa, and this is I'm Kanta, Kanta from, from a company party. called Party. Um, and uh, we're sort of like a creative lab design tech studio, uh, both working in Tokyo and New York. And uh, yeah, we love kind of inventing new combinations of storytelling, design, and technologies. We work for big brands like Google. We also create our own products. We've recently sort of helped redesign or design a new airport terminal for Narita. The Terminal 3 uh, was designed by us. Uh, we have those running tracks going across the whole airport there. Uh, um, we love, as you can see, we kind of like to um, do everything kind of humorously. We love, we love comedy. We like things that make uh, people smile. Um, and uh, I've done a lot of music videos. Uh, and again, those things on the right is more of our own products. Uh, he's got oh, yeah. one in his hands called the Piggyback Driver, uh, which allows kids to control your dad. So. Kid goes here, yeah, you know, the kid steers. Yeah, the kid here and uh, control the handle <laughs> and uh, Maybe he couldn't bring up. his son today, but you kind of get what it means. <laughs> so a lot of uh, fun, interesting um, gadgets and um, design work for ourselves and for our clients. Um, and, uh, you know, we're really happy that Paul reached out to us because he mentioned like Japan really cares about the output more than the process, but we really... Yeah pride ourselves to, um, you know, really be open about the process because creative process and the tools really dictate, you know, these certain outputs. I think so. The process will be, um, process will work very, mm -hmm. very effective on the results. So <coughs> that's, this is Tokyo office. Uh, as you can see, we purposely chosen like a very blurred one out of Paul's <laughs> stuff because it's very messy. Um, this is Tokyo. That's, this is more Tokyo office. Uh, I was Tokyo kind of in Daikanyama. Dakayama. And we started more doing like filmic work in Japan, so we have an office space, uh, but we don't have a maker's space, but more of a filming studio in the middle of Dakayama, which is kind of rare. So we shoot most of our music videos in the filmic products there. Uh, and in comparison, uh, this is New York. Uh, we've got about so, like so, 10 so people. At that time, you were out. I was away, office, yes, and but you so can see I forgot to there. clean up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's nice and messier. Right? We call it organized chaos, but. <laughs> 
really helps to have all the tools and you know everything. We like it dirty because we don't become too precious about the space. Uh, we love to make everything dirty. We solder things. We build things in our studio. So it really helps to be more free, you know, in terms of, oh, my God, can we just spray it? Yeah, just, you know, use the corner of the room, and we're fine kind of style. And I, I hope that kind of uh, shows in some of the weird things that we create. And this is oh, it's a sexy I've never, photo. I've view. never seen this one. It looks really nice, dude. Oh, yeah. You were a little slimmer back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, so, I got uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I went to Japan on a gal of weight. Yes, he just came back like two days yeah. ago. So um, excuse us for that. That's That was like a 3D printed figure of you and stuff. And that's the Tokyo office. So, and uh, I don't know if this really describes us quite well, but that's, that's us. And uh, Guess we move on to the panel discussion to this. Oh uh, yeah, so special part is we are having uh, two offices in Tokyo and New York City. Yeah, yeah. so we were looking. I think so we got double featured. In yes. This. <laughs> so thank you so much. Yes. So thank you. All right. So now that we've had a chance to meet our panelists, um, today we're going to have a panel discussion up here, and then uh, pass it to you, the audience. So be sure to be thinking of some things that you'd like to ask our panelists. The first thing that I'm really curious about is the studio can be such a private place. Um, it's where you're able to think and work. Why did you decide to, show, to share that with Paul? What made you decide to open your door? And the second part is, did you, were you surprised by anything you learned when you saw the photos? And this, this question's for everyone. Well, um, I know I am very messy. <laughs> but I'm always surprised when I see how messy I am. I, I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm being too hard on myself, but when I look at the photos, I was like, oh my God, my studio is so messy. <laughs> so that was my initial. I didn't do a good job of romanticizing it at all then. <laughs> you should have looked at it and thought, oh, look, actually it looks a lot, a lot less messy than I remember. I mean, there, it's nice that it's captured <laughs> in, in for posterity, but it's also um, a studio uh, like, you know, like, like how Murasan said, it's like you, it, you have to, it can't be precious. You know, I'm constantly spray painting, sanding, cutting, mm -hmm. reading, napping, eating. So it makes sense that it's messy. Reflects you. Yeah. So I guess I can't <laughs> complain. <laughs> I think it, yeah, I think we felt the same way as how, you know, Matt described it too. But, you know, we, we really had nothing to hide. That's mm -hmm. one thing. Um, it's really rare because I personally love uh, checking out other people's studio. You know, the animator studio, yeah. like technologist studio, painters, <clears throat> everything's all different. And then mm -hmm. there's also like, you know, I, I love kind of watching out for the secret sauce or like the mysteries behind like why, how can you make all these amazing work? And then uh, always there's clues, you know, in the tools they use and where they work. So, you know, I'm just naturally fascinated about that. So I felt like, well, that since I've been stealing a lot from other people, <laughs> maybe it's a time to now. <laughs> show it to the other people. I don't know if there's any hint in our places, but, you know, it was really uh, an interesting experience also. You know, it really looks beautiful on picture, so we were surprised at that. And also just kind of seeing the photos and the difference between the Tokyo office now and, you know, how we're operating in New York gives us a nice kind of contrast mm. in the mm -hmm. types of work that we do. Again, you know, we felt nothing's really changed, but, you know, Japan's sort of doing more of the branding work and more things on screen, so, you know, less, I guess, messiness in terms of circuit boards and, you know, tools and, you know, stuff like that versus New York, we do a lot more on the maker side of things. So mm -hmm. we do a lot of tinkering and I think it kind of comes through, you know. Yeah, in your, in your case it does, in your studio in the New York office, I think you can see the relationship between the space and what you do, but not always actually. Mm -hmm. Sometimes <laughs> you go into a space and I think like, like this is just not, not at all what I expected to see. Um, Nendo was one of those spaces, it was very minimal, and, and I love right. his work, Aki, Aki Sato. And it wasn't at all uh, a, a space that I would have thought, you know, so much incredible work is coming out of. Mm -hmm. Very controlled. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Uh, actually, for me, I don't like this order because uh, he, he, yeah. he, he, he just says <laughs> everything. Well, yeah, he just explains yeah. everything <laughs> in, uh, in his friend English. And so I don't have so much to talk about this, and, but uh, um, as he said, so it, it's almost the same thing. Yeah. Oh, we should switch that's places. That's okay. Yeah, that's okay. This is my kind of studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Ye
struggling. And so I need to struggle in this. I need to survive in this city. <laughs> so yeah, um, so it's the same. And um, the process is totally connected and directly connected with the result and the output. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, we're prioritizing how, how we create. Um, so um, we believe that kind of process of making will be reflected on the result and the awesome result. And um, so, um, so that, yeah, as, as he said, so. Yeah, a little support, but he's oh, our CTO. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, you know, we're like co-founders of the company. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like in charge of like pushing forward, you know, bringing Make the right the tools and making mm. the environment. So, you know, you'll be surprised. We have a little newer corner with a lot more like maker space that's dedicated to it and things. And he's really like the believer that, okay, we need to think with our hands and yeah. Yeah, make things. Yeah, actually, actually, I'm such a, how can I say, autistic guy. And so <laughs> very kind of addicted to making and focusing on making. And so it can be messy, but uh, this will be, might be reflecting my, how can I say, character of, uh, as a creator. It's yeah. part of the process. Mm -hmm. I think so. If, it, if it's any constellation, a, a, a messy space uh, is, a, is a great space to photograph. It gives me so much opportunity <laughs> to find little nooks and crannies. And um, it, yeah, it's often very difficult to really communicate this to, to people when going in to shoot, to leave the space as it is. And uh, you know, tr trust me, <laughs> I'll try to, I'll make it look okay. Um, so Unreal Age, I've shot them twice. They're in the current book and they're, mm -hmm. I shot them before. And um, I, I turned up to photograph them. And, I, and there's always something a bit lost in translation when, when I'm in Japan. And I don't know if they really got my memo about not cleaning up, but we got there <laughs> a little early. And I knocked on the door and they, they, they said hello and they closed the door. And then I could hear them cleaning like crazy. <laughs> and I'm like, I turned to my partner, Queen. I said, do we, I mean, I, they're going to ruin it. I want to get in there now. And um, I just thought, I, I, what's the etiquette here? She said, I don't know. I just don't know what. So I just let them clean. And I went in. Actually, it wasn't too bad. They didn't, they didn't put away everything. So it was an OK story. But then I found where they hid everything. They threw everything in the back into ah. like a storeroom. Yeah. And I kind of, at a certain point when I was sort of comfortable in there and now comfortable with me being in there, I kind of pried it open and took some <laughs> snaps of the store. And they're like, I got, this, I got a nice yeah, show. But, uh, I, don't, I don't want to show that book, this book to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny. I, I used to be an editor as well. And what we, we would always say to people before our photographers would come is, imagine your very good friend is coming over for lunch. So it's like every day but a little nicer, but not totally formal, not totally artificial. Um, so then I'd like to ask you, um, you, you noted in your presentation that um, seeing your studio in the book gave you a different perspective. Could you tell me about that? What did you notice or what surprised you seeing those photos like that?姿が全て表現活動だと思っているので、あの、スタジオを常に公開しているはい。so I consider um, the way I live my life part of my activities and my way of expressing myself. Uh, my studio is actually, um, it has glass, so anyone can come in and see what I'm doing. And I leave it open on weekends, so my activities and what I do are always open to anyone, anytime. However, I actually had it looking pretty nice when Paul came, uh, even though I know he doesn't like that very much. <laughs> There's times when it's really horrendous. <laughs> so we're actually creating a studio um, so in terms of um, making things, I actually travel all across the country throughout Japan and work with different um, craftspeople. Um, it's interesting to see how people um, make things, the process they're going through. And via viewing this, you actually get to see the person's background, um, their way of doing things. So that's part of my philosophy of why I leave my studio open as well. Mm -hmm. 
から読み取れたというかそういう部分ですかね。What I was able to gain from Paul's pictures,、um, it was a sense of what people、um, are wanting to see from the outside when they look at my studio. That was a different perspective. Shoes. Oh, oh, there was a picture of shoes, which surprised me.、Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that brings me to another question.、Um, Your studio is very interesting because it's not just a workplace, there, it's also your home. I believe the showroom is there as well. Can you talk to us a little bit about the different functions、um, that come together in this place and how they influence each other and your way of life?ポールが2回目に来たときに改装してたんですけれども、住めるようにあの改装して、キッチンとキッチンがあって、そのままその高さにそのままバスタブがついているっていう状態なんですね、今。Um, so, when Paul came to visit for the second time, I was actually in the process of renovating my home、uh, to make it more livable, and at the same、um, height of where the kitchen was, there was actually、um, a bathtub in that place. で、周りにすごいたくさんの植物があって、南の国の植物だっがジャングルみたいにあるんですけど、そこでそのオープンな空間であのお風呂に入ってます。Um, there were many plants、uh, from different southern areas. A lot of jungle、uh, vegetation was surrounding it, and this is a large open space,、uh, which is where、uh, we take our baths. 特に日本だとそういうオープンなあのバスルームってないと思うので、まあ、見た方はみんな驚く、まあ、日本の人以外の国の人が来ても皆さん驚くし、でもそういうことがまあ考えるきっかけになるというか。もしかしたら固定観念を覆すことにもなるのかなと思っています。特にヨーロッパの方は、まあ、そういったこの。It starts off with a series of introductions,、um, and each one features someone who has kind of cross cultural connections. Either they're born in Japan and, and, and had a career in Europe, or have worked, I guess, all around the world.、Um, now, you guys specifically, Matthew, you've had quite a bit of experience in both Japan, being, in, being from New York originally,、mm -hmm. and then also Party has offices in both Tokyo and、yeah. New York. I'm wondering, how does that international experience influence you? Do you find you work or think differently in different spaces, or how do, does it influence your work in a different way? I think it's,、uh, I don't know how you feel, but I think when you start out, you think it's going to be very different.、Mm. But then you realize that a lot of the work that comes from Japan that is well known is often produced by. Foreign designers. You know, like there's a lot of people think that, oh my God, the Shiseido packages and bottles, they're gorgeous. And they're all done by a French designer. <laughs> and then, you know, people say, oh, the Isemiyake stuff is gorgeous. And all the, a lot of that pa package design is done by Karim Rashid here in New York. So you realize very quickly that there's a global design scene. And how each geography influences that is very important. But when you start going back and forth, it gets so hard to separate like, what is influencing what. Because、mm. my very first、uh, experience as a professional designer was in Tokyo. You know, I dropped out of school and moved to Tokyo. So my culture shock was the reverse it was getting used to how to work in New York.、Mm. And I've been here a long time, and I don't think I've ever gotten used to it, to be quite honest. What's,、so、what's the difference for you? It's,、uh, it's a lot of different things. I mean,、uh, it's, so it's not so much the studio culture, it's about the, the human culture.、Okay. So, when you're a young designer in Tokyo, I was working for big ad agencies, and I got a job at a smaller agency, which was much better.、Um, and if you could tell I'm super talented, and I was super talented <laughs> even when I was young. But when you're young, I mean, they say in Japanese, deru kugi ga otairu. 
And it's, uh, is that the correct saying? Yes. 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 So yeah. um, if you stand out, you get hammered mm. down. And uh, I found it very difficult to work as a designer, as a young designer there. Wow. So these types of cultural things really affected me personally and it probably impacted my work. But how it influenced the way the work looks, it's going to be very hard for me to say. Mm -hmm. Someone like uh, a good journalist like you would have to analyze <laughs> it for me. But then um, you, when you go back and forth enough, and I've had offices in Tokyo for Nuka. We had a, a wonderful Tokyo office uh, that was in a beautiful house near the Aoyamabochi. And um, the spaces were very different. And it just gets to be a blur. Like, mm -hmm. you just can't. Uh, New York and Tokyo are so different, but they're so connected. Mm. Um, it's a really um, amazing, Troublous. and it's, 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 it's like I like to say when people say, oh, Japanese is so, uh, is so difficult, I'm like, no, it's very complicated, it's not mm. difficult. So my relationship to the two cultures is complicated, but I, I don't think uh, it's too complicated for me to answer mm -hmm. in a straight manner. I just gave you a very Japanese <laughs> answer in English. <laughs> I, didn't say, I didn't say anything, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Yeah, well, well yes. <laughs> yeah. Masa and Tanta, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, how, would you, how would you describe this actively working in both places with teams split between the two? Well, I mean, uh, I think it's almost like taking the best of both worlds and we get that liberty since we do have offices, real physical offices in two locations, and that's what we kind of intended to do from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Like, there's amazing Japanese design aesthetics that we want to tap into, but also we really want that sort of gro global reach and also like the audience that would really share and you know um, love the type of work that lives in New York as well. So, you know, and also like great coders and artists and musicians, also like the fashion and everything is here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, finding ways to like, you know, <coughs> import, export from both worlds is sort of our ambition. And uh, in order to do that, you know, we were trying to do it just out of the Tokyo office for a while, uh, but I was actually working and living here in New York before, you know, I started Party. So, you know, uh, it was kind of a logical um, decision to make, you know, hey, well, we probably want some sort of satellite or a physical entity outside of Japan in order to kind of break through a way. Uh, Japan is awesome, but it's also very close, and the whole deruku ga utareru kind of philosophy sort of is there. You know, you can't really do anything too different or you mm. get like slammed down and it's really hard market as well. So, you Th know. That's true of, of advertising as well? Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. But the thing about advertising that's interesting, and uh, we had a conversation about this, is people think Japanese advertising is amazing, but every ad agency, <laughs> every ad agency has a team just for international competitions. So what oh, you, wow. so what you yeah. see yeah. at Cannes and what you see in the annuals is not what you see when you're watching TV no. in Japan, so there's yeah. a disconnect. <laughs> Completely, yeah. and also the, we call it ochanoma, which means living room, but the audience mm. is very like unique and likes a certain style of communication, so it's all about celebrities, lots of like subtitling and things going on, which is a very unique aesthetic, and yeah. some people like that, but it's, it's really hard to do anything super different from that, aside from ones that they really want to challenge can and things like that. So. Again, interesting market, lots of talented people, but it's hard to really penetrate through the barriers of Japan. And if you really want to do something that's universal and global, which we really feel like is, should be the ambition if you're doing mass communication, you, know, you really need to have some way to like break free from that. So again, having New York is really helping us to do that so we can introduce the great stuff of Japan, but also giving the opportunity of like a global project mm -hmm. or you know just global talent network that you can tap uh, into. Probably I might be the kind of part test case of uh, kind of like pause of uh, <laughs> export. <laughs> Japanese, Japanese making pause and that. Uh, yeah, so for me, it's sort of different from this guy and because of uh, because he's been in the United States and uh, his childhood and uh, uh, I, I cheated, yeah, yes. <laughs> he, 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 yeah, he's cheating actually. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, I've, been, I've been in Japan, I, I can come for 37 years and since since three years ago, I've been, yeah, I've been here for just three years. And, uh, so um, he talked about the difference and he talked about uh, how can I say, um, between this and the America is this and that. I didn't have any space to think about the kind of thing. I just struggled 40 years and, uh, <laughs> and uh, of course, as you know, the kind of, the most difficult thing is language barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I struggled to kind of overcome this language barrier for two years and uh, I didn't have any space. And uh, 
So, um, for 37, so since I started to work, and so as you said, so sometimes in the advertisement industry, initially I, work, I started to work as an advertisement um, guy. And, uh, but uh, I, I worked in a very huge hierarchy, and uh, I was too familiar with Japanese industry hierarchy. And, but, uh, after moving here, um, I have to survive as a, just a craftsman because uh, I I need to. Yeah, I can't speak and I can't I can't communicate um, 100% accurately with American people, and uh, so I need to fight with my just uh, kind of my hand and uh, what I can make with hand, and um, so that leads so, to this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> So that kind of struggle was here, and uh, I didn't have any space to think about the difference. And but uh, the grab, very, very, uh, I, I'm I'm so glad to find that. So my craftsmanship and uh, skill as a craftsman is working in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the same as in Japan. So, so maybe it's the difference, but also yeah. the commonalities or like the, the crossover, I think. Is your office uh, here mostly Japanese or is it mixed? It's mixed, okay. yeah. It's like a 50-50 uh, ratio now, I guess. Mm. We tend to hire like Japanese. We try to avoid them, but they're really good. You know, it's so hard to resist. It's like, oh my God, you're so good, but damn, you're Japanese. But alas, you know, we're now like, okay, we'll just take you in for your talent and whatnot. But, yeah. And with that in mind, um, you know, in the presentations, uh, Hiroko, we saw your work with Fendi. Um, so obviously today we work in such an international global world. With, with that kind of culture and with the internet, do you think that these distinctions and these differences will matter as much in the future? Do you think that place will be important, um, an important part of the, the artist or creative's experience? ブランドを発表してるんですけれども、えっと、ま、彼らにとっては私の日本人らしいデザインが彼、あの、彼らは求めているっていうのをすごく感じるんですね。so currently, uh, with my brand, Takashi Hiroko, there's a company in England which has um, home products that they're putting out under my brand's name. Um, and what they really wanted from me was my uh, Japanese-ness. That was the sense that I felt. でも実際のところ私は自分が日本人であるっていうことを意識してデザインをしたりものづくりをしたことがずっとなかったんです。However, in all of my designing up until now, I never had the sense that I was Japanese as I was carrying out my work. 10年前にイタリアのプロダクトデザイナーのエンゾマーリさんという方とお仕事をしたんですけれども um, Ten years ago, I had a chance to work with Enzo Morrison, an Italian uh, producer. 彼に あの、ま、すごく巨匠なんですけれども、もう80半ばぐらいの方なんですが、彼にえ、お前のデザインは日本的すぎるから、ま、それはクッションカバーを彼の家具に合わせて作った時のものだったんですけれども、日本的すぎ
Um, so in working with foreigners, what they really want is my Japanese um, essence. This is something that I really felt. However, it's not something that I am aware of or really perceiving as I'm doing my creations. But I think that I do have to keep Japan as my base uh, in the process mm -hmm. of making things. And that's, that's really interesting. Before we, we turn it over to the audience, I want to ask you, Paul, the same question. Um, You've, you've kind of had a, a real nomad's life, starting in Australia, living in Amsterdam, and now based here in New York, having your second book come out about Japan. Mm -hmm. What is your perspective on the relationship between creativity and physical space? And also, why, why choose Japan for your first, first location-focused book? Well, that's easy. Japan is my favorite country, <laughs> and I wanted to explore it. Um, I, I feel like I never really get to know it, and um, I always feel that surprise when I go back, so I keep on going back. And I thought this was the perfect uh, opportunity to uh, go back and do a book and try to learn a bit more about Japan. Um, and, and, and for your first question, I think it's uh, probably a bit of a disappointing answer, but I feel like um, all spaces uh, across the globe that I've shot feel somewhat, there's something similar and something different about all of them, actually. Mm. Um, and I was thinking about this as we're talking, um, like what is the difference between, let's say, Japan and other, other countries I've visited um, in terms of uh, space? And probably not a lot, probably a bit smaller maybe, that, that might be it, um, but definitely more quiet. So I found that the Japanese working environment is much more quiet uh, overall compared to, say, uh, other places that I've been. Mm -hmm. People just put their head down and, and get stuck into work <laughs> more so. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I think it would be interesting to do uh, an analysis of what is, like I noticed that every design studio you go to, everyone seems to have this area where wooden robot, at least <laughs> on one desk. Oh yeah, always. And, every, and there's always like the same books uh, mm -hmm. that everyone has. and. Uh, that might be interesting to well, see. I, like, what I, is I, yeah, I got so sick of seeing uh, IKEA shelves <laughs> that I just avoided <laughs> photographing them now. So it doesn't look like nice no news. one has IKEA shelves anymore. <laughs> but actually, they're in almost every. They're ubiquitous in almost they're, those tall boys, those white ones. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just one. just <laughs> hate them. So I just just avoid <laughs> photographing them completely now. But if I go, but often there's lots of trinkets, and I like little mm. details. So I have to go mm. right in to make sure you can't tell that it's on <laughs> this particular shelf. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I noticed that, like in your New York office. Mm -hmm. All the contractors in New York, they must buy the same globe lamps at Home Depot. Because we have the same <laughs> yes. like globe lamps in the That's in the true. Studio. Yeah, finding like an average studio yeah. design would be very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we've got just about five minutes left, but afterwards we will go to a reception where I hope we'll all continue this conversation in person. But at this point, I'd like to turn it over to the audience. Does anyone have any questions for our panelists today? Yeah, this is for Paul. Um, I was curious to know, you mentioned this was the beginning of a, maybe a series of books. Yeah. If you could maybe let us know like what uh -huh. other areas or, or places you, you're considering to, to do. And also, um, have you, you've done this over a period of years, have you experienced <coughs> sort of a change in how people do interiors, you know, in terms of like the popularity, the rise of say Airbnb, so you can, yeah. you know, see like how there are certain things that might trend and, mm. and, and there's a, like a global look. You mentioned like the IKEA yeah. shelves and all that stuff. Um, so the, the series idea is, I guess I'm just going to start with uh, either practical or favorite uh, or just historical. So it'll probably be the US next, just because I live here. And, uh, and also in some ways, there's, there's always like a little ulterior motive to what like doing it, like Japan, I just wanted to spend more time and I'm trying to understand it. And then for the US, I realize I don't understand the US anymore, so I really want to explore the whole country. <laughs> that would be really interesting. And, and that, won't, that, that won't necessarily come into the message of the book, but you know, at least I'm going to be on that journey trying to understand. Um, and then probably Amsterdam, just because Frame are there and I lived there for a long time, and I think there's a, a lot of amazing creative going on out of Amsterdam. Um, maybe Italy next, I don't know, because my dad's Italian. But, um, and then the second question was, Trends that you've noticed mm. in office design. That's a that's a tricky one. I. Yeah, more similar. Well, obviously, you know, besides the IKEA thing that I keep on seeing everywhere, um, I, I think what I probably more to the point. It, it's like when I go to a, a new country and I'm photographing a new studio, um, like, and this is a weird detail, but like. 
the switches that they use. And I think, oh, wow, it's such a cool switch. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, two weeks or three weeks in of, of traveling through that city, I'm like, oh, that switch is just everywhere. <laughs> and that's often what happens. And I think, oh, I want to buy that switch and have it at home. Um, but not so much in a kind of a broader, I guess they're also studios, so they're not really public facing. I mean, um, I don't know, I mean, there's, there's always like, um, Kessel's Kramer is a studio I've done out of Amsterdam. And um, they kind of pioneered this sort of idea of the outside, inside of the, of the log cabin coming inside. And um, this, yeah, like uh, it, it looks like you're in the, in the Alps actually, but you're inside an old church. And you know, that, that was, you might, might be a little trend I'll see in like, or, or more to the point, I should say that in, in advertising agencies, you'll get this sort of, um, this very kind of extreme zany, rooms that they'll build out just to kind of counterpoint everything else that's going on. More that that I see across like agencies or graphic design firms, more than a trend in, in, in style mm -hmm. or something like this. Please, before we, before we begin the reception, join me in thanking Paul and our panelists, and also Thank our you. hosts, Thank Japan you. Society. Thank you, Heather.